thank you very much. It's great to be here um, and have the opportunity to present to a group of people who've made uh, improvements in other people's wellness, their primary priority in life. So thank you for you, who you are. Um, I was here initially supposed to talk about DNA, but I'm actually here to tell you that a Category 3 hurricane is going to make landfall soon in the realm of wellness, and it is wellness personalization, a disruptive force by, um, that is perpetuated by the availability of different kinds of information and data that was never before possible. Um, so the presentation is not up, or it is. Oh, there. Hey, great. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Oh, I have to go to the next slide. I'm, I'm used to people serving me now. <laughs> OK. So basically, what has happened in general in the past three years, which is, so if you have even looked into this topic five years ago, four years ago, you wouldn't really be aware of this. But in the past three years, there are substantial changes that have been happening from an economic perspective, from a technology perspective, a scientific perspective, with regards to how we can actually personalize wellness products and services the four forces that are coming together in order to shape this hurricane, Category 3 hurricane. Uh, the four forces, one of them is the availability of biological data. So biological data is DNA data, microbiome data, telomere data, um, also things that are more on the horizon, currently not available, uh, such as RNA data. Um, we have epigenetics, so all those are biological data and they're becoming more and more available. Then we have personal physiological data, so wearables data. Wearables wear, are, have been available for a long time, but initially what they used to provide us with is how many steps you've taken, how many calories you've burned, very basic stuff. And only in the past two, three years have very substantial players emerged in creating um, analytics around wearables. And now we can tell a lot of things just by having you wear a wearable for 48 hours. We can tell you a lot of things about your sleep, a lot of things about your stress levels, a lot of things about your nutrition, about your overall heart health, and many, many other things. Add to that the availability of additional understandings of behavioral change structures, mechanisms, the availability of mobile technology to collect data, personalized data from people, and you have a very comprehensive set of information. Now, the problem with all of that information is these are very different types of information. Adding them to just putting a lot of information in storage doesn't give you any insights about a person. You need to somehow be able to connect all of that data together to understand first what a person's needs are. And some of this data is static, like the DNA. Some of it is much more dynamic, like a wearable um, data. So how do you combine all these different types of data? And the only way to do that is through advanced artificial intelligence algorithms. And the advent of uh, very new algorithms within artificial intelligence are creating that opportunity for this perfect storm to come together. Now, what's pretty interesting is uh, people... Oh, how did I go back? Yep, OK. What's very interesting is people have also caught up with regards to what they demand of the wellness industry. We did a survey with Columbia University, nationwide survey, representative of the US population, carried out by a professional organization, a polling organization, on what people's attitudes were with regards to personalization. And what we found was pretty interesting. This population is the representative population of the US. It's not the population of people who are sitting here. It's all across. And we asked them, um, one of the questions within the report was, um, would you actually pay more or be interested in getting personalized products and services from uh, your providers. And it ranged anywhere from 42% to 71%, depending on what aspect of wellness products and services that we were discussing, with regards to how people really expected. They would say, I'm going to choose a brand that is offering me personalized information based on my biological data or other data uh, over another brand that doesn't, even if the other brand has a better marketing structure and everything else. And the, this is pretty important, and this report is available in case um, you guys want to get an access to it. It's a very comprehensive report on people's attitudes on personalization. Um, you can just contact me, and I'll send you a copy. 
Um, but I'm going to take this opportunity about the fragrance side, personalized fragrance side. You might have seen these little packets um, at the GWS registration desk, which had the different perfumes. So there's a collaboration between LifeNome and IFF to actually look at the genetics of uh, fragrance perception and the uh, fragrance of wellness. If you can participate in that, that would be great. Um, so once we have all this data, what we need to do is to understand, OK, so how big of a market is this? And initially, people that we talked to when we first started were saying, well, this is too small a market. We shouldn't really be concerned with it. Well, guess what? It's an exponential market. In 2014, there were only a million people who had DNA testing data. In 2017, we were supposed to have 9 million people by the end of the year. We passed 10 and a half by July. So this is a projection that is actually a lot more conservative than what's actually happening. And there's a good reason for that. The first human genome cost $45 million to sequence, and now you can get a DNA test done for less than $100. Huge shift. Now it's becoming much more feasible to get that data. So by 2020, we're talking about 40 million people. Who are these people? Well, people with relatively higher income. Probably 40 million people might actually just be 25% of the adult working population of the US. But if you actually take into consideration income levels, this is probably 70% of the people who are making $80,000 or above with regards to uh, and this is actually going to be expanding through the masses, um, going down in price and becoming much more available to everyone. So this is a pretty important thing to consider. Ten times one order of magnitude change in the number of people who have DNA testing in three years. This is exponential growth. If you can't see the hurricane on the horizon, you will be hit by it pretty bad. Even Rush Limbo left Florida. So think about it. So once we get all of that data, there's things that we need to do with that data. So we get all of this data, we get biological data, we get personalized data, and we need to be able to connect that data in a way that's meaningful. Things that have been done so far has primarily been statistical in nature. Uh, what people do is they say, OK, so we take a group, and this is generally medical science, is we take a group of people who have high blood pressure, we take a group of people who are low blood pressure, then we compare the two, and then we see what's different between the two. It doesn't really tell you much. It just says, um, and a lot of times those are statistical associations, they don't really have much of a meaning, don't tell us much about what we can do. But what does help when you actually do advanced analysis, and through that data, through the availability of that data, so for instance, right now we have access to more than 530,000 patients um, 1,500 characteristics across 530,000 patients that we can actually do analysis on. And that allows us to actually start modeling the body. Modeling the body, the biological processes in the body, not bottom up, that would be a, a task that would take two, two centuries. But looking at it from a data perspective, uh, basically top down, virtually. And that allows us to actually take a look at what the needs of an individual person are. OK, so we, let's assume that we now established what the needs of a person are. How does that, what kind of personalizations can we actually expect? You as a consumer and you as a wellness practitioner are going to see the following things pretty much assured within the next one to three years happening or being available around you. And these, the, I'm going to give you just five examples. I could give you 25 examples. And if you want in the break, I'll give you 25 examples. But there's not much time just to give you a sense of what can be done so far. So first part is the fact that nutritionally, our bodies don't process nutrients all the same way. My lovely co-founder, Dr. Ray Conan, who's also in the audience, uh, and I, we just decided to put our own data there because it's hard to put anyone else's data in a public presentation. If you look at the nutrition facts label for a single product, let's say that um, lean shake, forget about the don't look at brands and stuff. We just didn't. Uh, this was something that we did as a research. So um, if you look at the generic user, you get this nutrition facts label. And in that nutrition facts label, basically it assumes that everyone is the same. Every single person, whether they're 20 or 80, whatever background, it's going to be, they're going to get for, from this particular thing 12% um, of their daily sodium. 300 milligrams of sodium is 12%. For everyone? 
Well, no. It's very different. I'm sodium sensitive. It's actually, for me, this is 25% of my daily needs, not 12%. And it might be that for Raya, well, it's 14% of her daily needs. So it actually differs person by person. The nutrients we take in need to address the needs that we have. If you take the same kind of concept and apply it to weight loss, it becomes a lot more interesting. So with regards to weight loss, um, when you take DNA into consideration, in addition to other biological factors and to demographic factors and to personality behavior factors, I'm going to say something here that's very, very important. Whoever tells you genetics is enough, genetics is not enough. Genetics data is necessary, but not sufficient. So nature, nurture, and that's even a very oversimplification. It's basically nature, the genes you were born with, the nine months you spent in the womb, the early childhood years, the first seven years, your, and then the remaining time you were with your family and learned all the habits, and then your adult life. So all of those data are different sources of data that we need to do personalization. But what we actually realized is if you take DNA data into consideration, you get around 33% net effectiveness over a 12-month period, and this is very important. Many people lose weight initially, but the body goes back to the previous state because people cannot motivate themselves to keep up with processes that counteract their physiological needs. So if you understand those physiological needs, then you des design programs in such a way that they're more compatible, that people can actually sustainably um, adhere to them. And that actually increases also another other factor that's pretty important in weight loss, which is compliance with the diet plan. Much more possible to comply with a diet plan if you have something that's more personalized to you. This is both because of the physiological processes, but it's also a psychological issue. I want something to be geared towards me, and therefore I commit to it more than if it's just a mass thing. Um, third area, skincare personalization. Now, what is quite, quite interesting is the way we do skincare right now is there's a lot of marketing. We're told this particular serum does, does miracles, and it probably does. It might actually do it for 60% of the people, but am I, how, how, what if I'm part of the 40% for whom this doesn't work? So I really need to understand what are my skincare needs, and based on those needs, be able to get um, some much more customized interactions. And there are more than 30 skincare traits that are genetically influenced, uh, just for you to get a sense. Another area that has been discussed a lot in this summit has been corporate wellness, employee wellness, and things like that. A lot of times we take one part of it, sleep, nutrition, stress. In reality, wellness is a combination on all of these, and each of them impact everything else. If I didn't sleep well last night, my fitness, my nutrition, my stress levels are going to be impacted today. We don't have an understanding of how these things affect each other. Why? Because there's so many things that we do in a day, we can't do a causality based on that. But understanding from taking into consideration your genetic uh, characteristics, your wearables data, environmental sensors, um, personality uh, and behavioral uh, information, we can actually look at the interactions, all of these for every single person, and also then be able to measure, and this is important, Unless you measure something, it's very hard to prove effectiveness. And we need to be able to measure the impact of wellness pro programs on longevity. We need to, longevity is how long you live. Vitality is how well you live from a physical perspective, how energetically you live. Mindfulness is not, I didn't use psychological well-being, because psychological well-being actually just talks about what, what mental diseases you do not have, whereas men, the mindfulness is about how your spirit is actually soaring and it's growing. So we need to look at that and we need to look at community. I'm going to actually emphasize something that Alyssa said in the previous talk, and that's the issue of resilience. And resilience goes all across. Physical resilience in order to withstand disease, resilience with regards to feeling depressed and non-energetic, resilience with regards to psychological breakdown and stress, resilience with regards to loss of community and of family. All of these are pretty important. 
Something that we've noticed very much is the fact that community is critical to wellness. I can have, you can take me to any spa, put me there for two weeks, all of my indices go up, I'm healthy, well, and everything. I come home, my son is sick, seriously sick. I'm not going to be well. Not going to be well. So what's very important is as social animals that we are, because we care, because of our emotions, our community is very, very important. So when we think about wellness, let's think about wellness within the smaller community. No, there's, there's public health, there's individual wellness, and then there is basically the group wellness of people around you. And that's pretty critical. We have to think about that when programming. And the last part, for many of you who do have spas or are interested in those ideas, the, the, the desire of now there's a lot more changes that are happening within the space where one can offer individuals very personalized treatments. And there's some changes on the horizon that make it even more interesting. So the, a lot of you participated in our um, in the um, Life Gnome Total Wellness Insights um, process, and we're frustrated by the fact that it takes four to six weeks for this DNA thing to be processed. Why does it take so long? Well, the te technology isn't there, the economics isn't there, and everything else. But actually, within the next six months, at least we are, and there are other, partner, there are other uh, companies doing this as well, there's a shift towards accelerating that process, making it actually possible to use it in a much more effective way. So our plan is within the six months to look at 48-hour DNA processing. Now, this makes things a lot more feasible. So if you're in a spa, day one, you get your DNA tested. Day three, you have your personalized treatment. Now, that is something that you can actually do. So this is very important. All the, these changes are making this category three hurricane into category five hurricane over time. Um, I'm going to actually go very quickly through this. In the next one to three years, what's going to happen is we will have, I have no doubt, that um, personalization will take the market by storm or by hurricane, uh, whichever. Um, there's some positive trends that are going to happen. Costs are going to go down. The science is going to improve. Um, there's some negative things that are going to happen. This is a fad. You're going to have a lot of companies coming in offering magic. There is no magic. OK, so this is all probabilities and risk models and everything else, and we need more data, more and more data to make it work. After the initial gold rush period is done, there's going to be an emphasis on validation and effectiveness. If you want to have a personalized product and service, it needs to help you. Now, this is the thing about thinking about hurricanes when they're coming. Do you prepare or do you hope for the best that they don't hit? And it's most of the time not wise to hope that they will actually go away. On the right-hand side, you see the Nokia. This is the cover of Forbes magazine in 2007, 10 years ago. And it says, Nokia, 1 billion customers. Can anyone catch the cell phone king? Eight months after the iPhone was launched. Thank you very much.